This is going to be James chapter 2, and we are going to start in verses 14 through 23, and then go back from there. And these verses talk about faith and works. We are going to look at the practical as well as the doctrinal. Practically, it is showing us that Christians in the church age show our faith through works. And this gives us justification in the eyes of man. But it also shows us that Abraham got righteousness by believing God in Genesis 15, but his faith wasn't made perfect until he offered up Isaac in Genesis 22. For Abraham, it wasn't referring to justification in the eyes of man because no man was around when he offered up Isaac. And these verses also show us doctrine of a future time period in the tribulation where men are saved by faith plus works, and we will get more into that later on. The Bible is an amazing book and that it is written in such a way that any person from any period of time can get a truth out of it. But James 2.14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, that a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? Yes, faith alone can save a man in the church age. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now skip down to verse 17. It says, in James 2.17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. And then if you look back at Ecclesiastes 4.9, it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Just like two people get a good reward for their labor because there are two of them, a Christian will get a good reward for his labor at the judgment seat of Christ if he doesn't just have faith but works also. The two together is better than one at the judgment seat of Christ. A man in this age is saved by faith alone and can get to the judgment seat of Christ and not have rewards because he didn't work for the Lord. And then James 2.18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In the practical sense, this is saying if a man has faith, he needs to show his faith through works. And we will look more in, at the doctrinal sense later. But when a man shows his faith through his works, then he is justified in the eyes of man. In the church age, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood. And we do works because we love God. When we do good works in front of people, then we are justified in the eyes of man. We were already justified in the eyes of God the moment we got saved. And then James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Notice that Abraham wasn't justified until he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. And then verse 22 says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So he was justified in Genesis 22 when he offered up Isaac, but Abraham got imputed righteousness way before this in Genesis 15. A lot of people claim he was saved by looking forward to the cross, and use verses like John 8.56 which says your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. They use verses like that to say that he saw Jesus dying on the cross for our sins when he was offering up Isaac. And that is how Abraham obtained salvation because he looked forward to the cross and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if he did see Jesus dying on the cross, he still wasn't saved the same way because the Bible says he got righteousness in Genesis 15. He was saved in Genesis 15 because he believed God about his seed. In Genesis 15, 5 it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. 
and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham was saved by faith in something, but that something wasn't what we place our faith in to be saved. So there's a difference there. The faith we have is complete because it is based on the completed work of Christ. Abraham had faith, but his faith wasn't perfect. It needed perfecting. And it wasn't perfected until he showed his faith by his work when he offered up Isaac. Our faith is perfect the moment we have faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But we can get some practical things out of this because James shows us justification in the eyes of men in these, in these verses. And shows us how we should show our faith by our works in the eyes of men. Paul does the opposite of James because Paul speaks of justification in the eyes of God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our crucified, buried, and risen Savior, then we are believing the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15. But the gospel preached to Abraham was different. Look at Galatians 3.8, it says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. I believe James 2 also shows something in the future where the tribulation saints are going to be justified by works. Revelation 14.12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. The saints here would be those Jews in the tribulation, the tribulation saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, so there is a big difference between our salvation now and salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. It isn't exactly like Abraham's because Abraham was justified when he offered up Isaac on the altar and he got uh, his righteousness by believing in Genesis 15 and these tribulation saints will be justified by faith and works but the works they're going to have to do is things like not taking the mark of the beast and they have to keep the commandments of God but with these things in mind we're going to take a practical look at this chapter as well and see how we can show our faith by our works the first thing we're going to look at is Christian Christians can show their faith by not having respect of persons. James 2 1 says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Did you know it is a sin to have respect of persons? James 2 9 says, But if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And then Proverbs twenty four twenty three says, These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. Proverbs 28.21 To have respect of persons is not good, for for a piece of bread that man will transgress. How many times have you respected someone more than another just because of the clothes they were wearing, or where they lived, or what they drove? James 2 and verse 2 says, For if there, if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and th say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit there under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Notice it says gold ring. Someone that had a gold ring in those times would be rich. But still the th same thing goes on today where like an NBA player gets more respect because he has six rings compared to one who doesn't have any rings or someone who never made it professionally. And people will have respect of persons towards these athletes or people consider these rappers to be gods. And all they rap or sing about is their jewelry and cars. People are partial to them because they are rich and famous. The news will show when celebrities break up or one of their family members dies because people care so much about these false idols. If they were to walk in your assembly, most people would show partiality towards them. And that is sin. It's a sin to show someone more respect because they are rich. The Bible teaches to not have partiality. 
James 2, 3 says, And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. And say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Notice it says gay clothing. The devil has changed this word, along with other words in the Bible, like the word piss, ass, bastard, Peter, John, prick, bowels, privy, and others, and has turned them into cuss words or dirty words. He's even got people disgusted of the word blood because they have watched so many slasher movies. While on the other hand, it has perverted many minds into loving to see bloodshed. Either way, both types of those people can't stand to hear about the blood of Jesus Christ because of what Satan has done with the word blood. But I think it says gay clothing because this is a last day's book where sodomites are going to be so common that when people meet a stranger, they will ask that person if they are attracted to men or women. I'm 27 now, and I had never met a sodomite growing up, but now they are everywhere. I think I was 7 years old before I even knew what a queer or lesbian was, and that is only because I watched a wicked Hollywood movie that showed a sodomite couple. I heard Danny Castle say that in 10 years from now, People will probably laugh at you if you aren't at least a bisexual. So it says, gay clothing in verse 3. And you can already see now where men dress in gay clothing. The word here in James 2.3 means cheerful. But if you heard someone say gay clothing now, you would think of a clothes a sodomite wears because the devil has changed these words around so much. I think the Holy Ghost putting the phrase gay clothing here that he, he could be giving us a prophecy of how men will dress in the end times. No doubt we are living in perilous times where you have men dressing up like women. Especially in 2016 where transgender people can go in whatever bathroom they want. And you have rappers like ASAP Rocky and Will Smith's son who who dress up in skirts and women in women's clothes and people see this as acceptable. I know in the Old Testament men wore skirts because Exodus 20:26 20, says, "Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon." But now obviously skirts are women's clothing and men look like sodomites when they wear women's clothes. But James 2, 4 says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Notice it says, judges of evil thoughts. One reason is because the judicial system is corrupt, and they operate through partiality. Also, in the tribulation, the judicial system will be full of sodomites. They will have respect to, do to those that wear the gay clothing. They will respect the rich people who took the mark. The ones in the gay clothing are the rich people, while the ones in vile raiment are the poor people. James 2, five says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Notice the poor during the tribulation time period are the ones who will also inherit the kingdom, while the rich ones go to hell. The poor of the tribulations are the ones who are rich in faith, like the church in Smyrna, in Revelation 2, 8 and 9, God said that, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. They are rich because they have faith, and they got something better waiting for them in eternity. The rich may get a lot of material things, but all that stuff will be burned up. The poor in the time of Jacob's trouble are the ones who are rich in faith. There are all kinds of poor people in the church age who aren't rich in faith, but they live like the devil. And so this shows that James 2 is referring to the poor of the tribulation time period and not to the poor of the time we are living in now. And James 2, 6 says, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Once again, you have the rich in connection with the judgment seats. The poor, poor will be despised during the tribulation, and the Jews will be a burdensome stone. And James 2, 7 says, Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? Did you know that it is blasphemy to take the Lord's name in vain? 
Many Christians will sit and watch the wicked world curse God and add the word damn at the end of his name. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. It is taking the Lord's name in vain when you say, By God, or OMG, or Oh my Lord, when you shouldn't throw the Lord's name around so easily. Did you know this wicked world loves to blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian that watches shows like Family Guy, American Dad, The Simpsons, Saturday Night Live, and other shows that all blaspheme Jesus Christ on a regular basis? Jesus Christ is the name above every name, and every one of these people who blaspheme him will bow down one day. Philippians 2, 9-11 through 11 says, Wherefore God hath God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And then James 2, 8, 9 says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself ye do well. But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So Christians should show their faith by not having respect of persons. Secondly, Christians should show their faith by having morals. Even though we don't get righteousness from the law, and we are under the curse of the law, and Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, we can still get examples of how to live by looking at the law. Even though we have freedom from the law, we shouldn't have a careless attitude and say, I'll do whatever I want since I'm saved by grace through faith. But James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So this shows us all of these people who are trying to justify their self by keeping the law and be saved by their own righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness. When they offend the law in one point, they are guilty of all of it. And then James 2.11 says, For he that said, do not, do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So if you just commit one sin, you transgressed. In Romans 3.22, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Every single person you know has broken the law. And even though we are saved by grace through faith, we should try our best not to do the things like committing adultery, killing, bearing false witness, coveting, or any command that God tells us not to do. We should try our best not to do it. When you get saved, you became a new creature. This new creature can't sin, but you still have the old man and your sinful flesh that still sins. And when you give in to the flesh and break one of God's commands, that means you have transgressed. Thank God, though, since we have the spiritual circumcision, when we sin, those sins aren't applied to our soul. We are sealed into the day of redemption and can't lose our salvation. But we should try our best to be moral and not break the laws of God. James 2.12 says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Although James talks about a law of liberty, it doesn't seem to match what Paul says in his epistles because Paul says we are dead to the law and free from the law. Well, James doesn't say anything like that but goes on to talk about having good works in verse 14. Paul also never says law of liberty. He talks about the law of the Spirit in Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath, hath, made, us, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then Romans 7, 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to, the, to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And then Galatians 2, 19, For, though, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Paul's epistles are written to born-again believers in the church age, while well, the book of James is written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad in the time of Jacob's trouble. And that is the reason for the differences. The Bible doesn't contradict. You just have to rightly divide. James 2.12 and 2.13 says, So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the, by the law of liberty. 
for she for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment this can't be referring to a christian because a christian will need mercy at the judgment seat of christ because paul says it is a terror in second corinthians 5:10 and 11 you can see where paul calls the judgment seat of christ a terror then Paul says again in 2 Timothy 1.18, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy over the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So in two different places there you have showing that we're going to need mercy. Christians will need mercy. And, they, and we'll get mercy during the judgment seat of Christ. Now we're going to look at James 2.14-18 again. And this is is what shows in a practical sense that a Christian is justified by works in the eyes of men, but in a doct doctrinal sense this is referring to a different group of people in the tribulation who have a salvation with a faith plus works set up. James 2.14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, which they will be in the tribulation, and one of you saying to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? The brother and sister who are naked and destitute of daily food are Jews from the twelve tribes. The ones who don't give them food and clothes are the ones from verse 13 who shall receive judgment without mercy. If these people endure the tribulation and are present during the time Matthew 25 speaks of, then they are judged without mercy, and the Lord takes vengeance on them in flaming fire because they didn't help the believing Jews in the tribulation time period. Matthew 25 talks about the judgment of the nations where the Lord separates the sheep from the goats, and the ones who treated his people right receive mercy and go into the kingdom, but the ones who mistreated his people will receive judgment without mercy and go into flaming fire. Look at the judgment of the nations in Matthew twenty five thirty two. It says, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set up the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them verily I say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for I was in hunger and ye gave me no meat I was thirsty and ye gave me no drink I was a stranger and ye took me not in naked and ye clothed me not sick and in prison and ye visited me not then shall they also answer him saying lord when saw we thee in, thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the, of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And James 2.17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. And faith alone in the church age is enough to save the sinner, but in the tribulation time period, it isn't enough. Galatians 2.16, which is two born-again believers in the church age, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. This is church age doctrine. Now look at tribulation doctrine. Revelation twelve seventeen says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is a faith plus works setup. In the church age, 
though in a doctrinal sense, faith without works isn't dead or alone. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Faith is enough to get you to heaven in the time we're living in. You can't reconcile James 2.17 and Romans 4.5 there to two different groups of people. And then James 2.18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham believed what God said. He placed his faith in something to be saved. He wasn't, faithing, he wasn't placing his faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can read about in Genesis 15 about what Abraham believed. And his salvation is a type of our salvation. But his salvation was still different. He wasn't spiritually circumcised like us. We're adopted into the family of God. He wasn't. We're sons of God. He's a friend of God. He didn't go to the third heaven when he died. But we go to the third heaven when we die. He wasn't born again. He didn't have his sins taken away. So you can see these major differences of how his salvation was different than our salvation. And then James 2.24, you see then how that by works of man is justified and not by faith only. This is a completely different form of salvation in the church age than the church age because we are justified the moment we believe whether or not we do a work. When I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I was justified that very moment. Although you can use these verses in a practical sense to say a born-again believer in the time we are in now is justified by works in the eyes of men. But when Abraham offered up Isaac, there wasn't any men around. So he wasn't justified by works in the eyes of men wouldn't he be justified by works in the eyes of God? How was he justified by works in the eyes of men if there wasn't any men around? And that's what Romans 4 2 is talking about. It says, For Abraham, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. He he couldn't glory before God, and there was no man around to glory. If he could glory somewhere, then that is well, that would be to men, but not before God. He couldn't glory to men because no one was around when he offered up Isaac. And he couldn't tell anyone he offered up Isaac because he ended up not going through with it. But you in the church age are justified in the eyes of God when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh... 1 Peter 1, 8 through 8-9 says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice, with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Your faith doesn't have to be made perfect if you are a church age saint. You believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You aren't waiting for any scriptures to be fulfilled so that you can get you are imputed righteousness. And that wasn't the case for Abraham. Look at verse 23 again. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So his imputed righteousness wasn't fulfilled when he got it in Genesis 15. It wasn't fulfilled until way later in Genesis 22. And now let's go back and pick up verse 19 because I skipped over it. It says, uh, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And that shows us a Christian can show, show his faith by believing in one God and fearing that one God. You say, well, don't Christians believe in one God? 
Yeah, but they don't act like it. They've got all kinds of other stuff they put ahead of God. They put their self ahead of God. And don't by doing those things, you make those things that you're putting ahead of God, you make those things of God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs 9.10. And you're not showing much fear of the Lord when you're putting so much before Him. And the verse said the devils believe there is a God, but the devils aren't saved. And then a lost man can believe there is a God and not place his faith in Jesus Christ and he will go to hell. A lot of people are doing worse than these devils are doing because they believe in God but yet don't fear him. At least it says the devils fear God. It says they believe and tremble. And then in Luke 4.34 it says, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The devils knew Jesus could destroy them. People don't realize that God is a consuming fire and that they should fear Him. The Bible says, Fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In Matthew 10, 28. And then notice also the beginning of James 2, 19 says, Thou believest there is one God. You can see in the time we are living in, as I said before, that there are a lot of polytheists. They believe in more than one God. And in these perilous times we are in, and even more so in the coming tribulation, people will think that they can be their own God. So therefore they believe in many gods. If you believe everyone can be their own God, then don't you believe there's a bunch of little gods running around? And then these transhumanists also want to be their own God, and that is why they hate the true God of the Bible. So Christians, Christians can show their faith by exalting the one God and fearing the one true God of the Bible. James 2, 25 through 26 says, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. This was a time when it was okay to tell a lie. And you're thinking right now, well, what are you talking about? But in this situation, it was okay for Rahab to tell a lie. And this was when she was hiding some of God's people. An atheist asked me one time if I thought lying was a sin. And I said, yes. Then she said, what if one of your loved ones was hiding from a killer and the killer knocked on your door and asked you where your sister or brother or whoever else you're hiding was located at? Would you point them in the right direction and tell them where they are? Or would you tell a lie so that you could save your loved one's life? I said I'd tell a lie. I wouldn't tell them where they were. And this is one of those cases where it is okay to tell a lie. And in Joshua 2.3 it says, And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be... Come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said, Thus there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. So Rahab told a lie and was justified for doing so. It is very fitting to put this in the book of James because it is written towards a time when a person may have to hide a bunch of Jews so that they won't get killed by the Antichrist henchmen. Also, it is very fitting to use the example of Abraham because a Jew in the tribulation time period could be put in a situation where he either has to deny God or see his son get beheaded. He would be faced with a decision similar to Abraham's based on who was more important, his loved ones or God. And then James 2.26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Notice it says the body without the spirit is dead. And Paul tells us that man has three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit. He lets us know this in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 where it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that when you were born, you had an empty spirit? but your body and soul was alive. Then after you are born again, your spirit is quickened. 
So you have a life, spirit, and soul, but you are to reckon your body dead, as it says in Romans 6, 11 through 12. So before and after salvation, you are really just two-thirds of a man. And two-thirds in fractional form is 0 .666. And 666 is the number of a man, as it says in Revelation 13:18. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. You will be made whole at the rapture when you get your glorified body. Romans 8.23 says, And not only they, but, also, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So this has been James chapter 2, and we will start up again in James chapter 3 later.